Welcome back to Archmere and the continuation of our tour of the basement. In the last episode, Tom and I took you into the manor where we looked at the three-phase electrical system, the ice plant, and the laundry. Then we walked through the tunnel into the basement of the patio and we explored the valet's room, the wine cellar, and other rooms used for canning and for storing food. And finally ending up here in front of a 90-foot well that was used for cooling water and that was used in our HVAC system, a state-of-the-art system at the time. That's where we had to end our tour. So now let's pick it up again, and Tom is going to explain to us in more detail how the heating and cooling system of the house worked and functioned in its day. Hi, Tom. This, this looks like something nautical, almost like a, a <laughs> sub or something with the, the it, hatches and everything. It does. Captain Nemo is, yeah. is somewhere inside <laughs> of that. Remember all those steam pipes? Uh, this is where they're going to come. If you, can we pan down there to the right? That's the outside wall of the house again. And look at all those wrapped pipes coming in. So we have a ton of steam coming over from the garage through the tunnel that we walked you through a few minutes ago. And it's all going to end up, or at least a great deal of it is going to end up, in this big compartment up here. I'm going to call it an air handler. And to be able to give you some kind of an idea, we're guessing at this. There are no, there's no real information on paper about how it actually worked. Because most of the system has been disassembled and unfortunately, like many things, removed from the property. But I'm deducing how it may have worked. This might be a trip. Watch your feet. We're going to go around the other side of the air handle. Yeah. Now this still does provide heat yes, to the still, patio. Yes, the fan and the system manor. works. Yeah. See the giant fan and the pulleys here. This would service all the forced air sections of the building. But we have to force cold air in and we have to force warm air in depending on the season. There's a big hole in the foundation over here, and that's going to draw the outside air, which even in regular homes, we need to be able to draw outside air. And it's going to pass into this chamber. Let's see if I can get it open. And, but you're going to see a giant radiator. It looks like a giant radiator up there. Well, so you see the, the air, if we talk about warming the air first, that air coming in goes through that giant radiator and is warmed up. And then it's going to be ducted out through the system. Now they can control the humidity. If you pan just to the right, it's going to look like a bunch of uh, pipes sticking up in the air and they have spray nozzles on them. We can up the winter humidity by putting an aerosol mist of water from the well up into that chamber. And then the air passes through. We can capture the water on the other side through baffles, recirculate that, and then the warmed air will go someplace we're going to visit shortly. Those same nozzles are going to play a big role in the central air conditioning system because what's going to be sprayed through them is water that has been cooled down to 62 degrees. So that member of the refrigeration plant over in the basement of the other part of the basement in the garage, that cold brine enters this room at 25 degrees also, and there's a big circulating tank underneath the back side of this handler. 
So the well water comes in at, say, uh, above 60 or 25 degrees, obviously. So that can chill 105 gallons of water every minute down to 60 some degrees. And then if you spray the chilled water through an aerosol mist, the air passing across it is going to be chilled and then it will be ducted out through the house to the areas that have forced air and now air conditioning systems involved in that. And I'll show you that chamber. We're going to have to walk around the other side. Ah, uh, yes, there you go. So all that water that was sprayed above what you're looking at now, um, we don't want all that water in it as it goes through the house. So there are baffles between those coils that you can see in front of you, and then that water is re uh, claimed in the baffles, comes back into this tank, and this is the recirculating tank, which can be continually chilled by the brine system, giving us air-conditioned air to send out. Now, that's how I think it worked. We're not absolutely sure. I don't think anyone ever will be because there is no documentation left. No, a lot of the machinery is gone. And uh, what we do know that there are significant portions of the first floor of the patio and the second floor loggias that actually were air conditioned spaces. The others had steam radiators. So there are steam pipes going to those uh, and they're reheated. I'll show you those in, in just a moment, okay? Tom, that was a fascinating explanation of the HVAC system in here. It's pretty clear that the impact of the industrial revolution was felt the early 20th century with sort of quote state of the art ingenuity for an air cooling system that early. Right. I would never have thought a house in the early teens would have had a version of air conditioning. Right. That actually, that uh, carrier, I think, uh, did the first commercial applications of, uh, and a printing plant, if I, if I recall. So it was available then uh, as well, but very few mm -hmm. would have. And certainly, I imagine, on this scale, maybe like the three-phase electrical system, he borrowed simply from a a much more, uh, a much larger kind of installation and simply had his, McClure, his engineer, uh, adapt it to the house. Yeah. Whatever it did, it worked yeah. in that. <laughs> Pretty amazing. One more door on this corridor before we actually leave this one little section of the basement, believe it or not, and that is this chamber here. And you see organ pipes because this is what's called an echo division. The brass cobs had a pretty massive pipe organ for entertainment installed in the house. And it would be uh, fairly common to have a very tiny portion of the organ, almost in itself a, a mini organ, uh, away from the main organ. And if you look, pan all the way up to the ceiling, you're gonna see a grate in the ceiling. And that is open to the floor in the patio behind one of the sets of French doors to just to the right of the main fireplace. So from the music room at the console, the organist could make music come out of, across the patio. So sometimes it's called an antiphonal organ or an echo chamber division. So Tom, I've noticed that there's a definite transition right here between like the flooring, the woodwork, uh, just the finishes, they seem a lot more uh, detailed and ornate. Right, that was a, that's a great observation. We're beginning to approach parts of the basement that were meant for entertainment, that the family would, could have used and may have used, and certainly uh, the guests would have done too, and not, not to mention the children. We're going to get to see those momentarily, but we're also first going to duck into another kind of hidden spot in the basement that is purely a work area in that. So we're going to follow Michael right through that door. Okay, we're in what I call service tunnels. Uh, if you've been in the building before, in the patio, you know there's a great open court on the first floor. And if the roof still opened, it would be simply open to the sky. And the rooms that surround that court are called, or that the walkway around the court under the pillars is called a loggia. Well, that's repeated down here with the exception that the center part of the building is not excavated. There's no basement under that wall. So in a sense, if you look down on it, that would be the dirt under the patio proper 
with a retaining wall built around it, and then this tunnel or loggia around it. But this is purely for service because this is where all the duct work, in fact, come on this way, you can see how this is set up. We did mention in the other room that this building is filled with individual thermostats. So they had lots of thermostatic control in various sections. You can read here, this is the duct work that uh, goes to the second floor loggia on the northwest side of the building. Uh, there's the second floor north or main stairway and so on and so forth. So if you went in a big circle around this center unexcavated core, which is directly under the floor of the building, then you find all the ductwork servicing those areas. And you find steam pipes because you could reheat that air. In other words, if I'm on, in my bedroom and I want a hotter room, I can click my thermostat and the reheater will kick in for that section that I just asked for or lower it one way or the other. So this is a massive tunnel system under the, under the building. Uh, and in fact, it come, and what you see here is the blower for the main organ, which is being not restored, but a new one is being installed. Yeah, it's a it's historic organ. It's being rebuilt uh, with the help of all volunteer labor and gifts of organ parts, which is fascinating. And that's another story, as Tom said, yeah, right. for another time. And if you look down there, there's another small blower. That's the one for the little echo organ that we just showed you. You can see how long these tunnels are. And people get lost. That's why they painted on the wall the direction. Mm -hmm. You don't know it, but you're walking toward the Delaware River now. That's the east side of the house. The front portico would be on that side of the house. The only thing that interrupts this solid block of unexcavated dirt is a tiny tunnel that reaches into the cent very center, and that's where the mechanism for the fountain that is in the center of the patio is located. So other than that, behind this wall, on every one of the sides of the patio, it is simply dirt. Not, never excavated. Never excavated. Which makes sense. There's so much basement. Anyway, we, we still haven't even seen it all. Yeah. And I've heard that many stories from early graduates uh, of Archmere who used to try to sneak into that fountain room using the small tunnel. I think in those days it was to smoke cigarettes. Probably. Probably. Which was a very big no-no. All right, let's head back to that transition area that Michael pointed out a few minutes ago. And we're going to leave all the service. So if all I've been doing now, or both of us have been doing, is showing you where the works of the building are but there were living parts of the basement as well. By the way, one of the reason this is in the tunnel is it's going to make a racket. And if you're playing the organ, you don't want all this mechanical noise where the music is coming through, so they isolate this kind of machinery. There's the duct from the original Raskob organ there. We'll, we'll pass through on our last pass the uh, room in which the organ was installed, and the new one is being put in. So we're in the more formal area of the basement that would have been used for entertaining, as Tom said. And I would say about 10 years ago, uh, we began restoration of this level. We had standing water in here of about six inches when we'd have heavy rains. It rotted a lot of the woodwork, and it also buckled the original floor. So unfortunately, we couldn't salvage the original terracotta flooring, and we installed new flooring in a similar style. Also, we don't know what the original lighting was in this place because we have no photographs from the day. So there were fluorescent lightings from the 1950s and lockers were actually lining that, these that wall. walls when this was the school building up until 1959. So we began the restoration of this level and there are restrooms on this side of the uh, vestibule area. And there were two separate restrooms. W one originally, I guess, a ladies room and a men's room. Yeah. Bo both actually were converted to men's rooms because we were an all-boys academy for so many years. Those were all uh, redone and refurbished in uh, such a way that we enlarged one of the restrooms into one of the safe areas. As, as Tom said, there were two refrigerated safe areas down here. We broke through the wall and converted one of the safe areas into actually a lounge uh, for the ladies that was adjacent to the bathrooms. 
and you'll be able to see those now. Yeah. Tom, would you like to and add the additional? Cast, the, the marble stairs are coming directly from upstairs in the patio, uh, on the west side of the patio. And this is how the family, children, guests, and anybody, they wouldn't go to the work areas where we've just been. Uh, this is their domain out here now. But as Michael alluded to, come on in here. This is the ladies, now the ladies' lounge. And I want to show you where Mrs. Raskob's furs used to live. Remember I said the refrigeration unit would actually have uh, serviced this area as well. Now the school also used it as a meat storage. And I mean, when we were a boarding school and they prepared meals here. Uh, but that actually was a refrigerated uh, system. And the brine coming over from the manor through the tunnel would take care of this area as well. And that finish is exactly the same finish that would have been in this area, but you can see it was completely refurbished yeah. and made more of a sitting area because it was more functional. However, we wanted to remind everyone what they were walking into, <laughs> so you can still see the large safe door here on the outside that we, we've retained. And so you can see on the walls, we have photos of furs from the period paying homage to Mrs. Raskob and her fur collection. But in any event, the Raskobs built this as purely part of an entertainment. That was not uncommon in big estates. Uh, they had to make their own amusement. You think back even before talkies in the movies, uh, they had to provide their own. That's the reason for the pipe organ, one of the reasons for the pipe organ. And the others would be, what, what do we do to entertain ourselves? We have great grounds, horseback riding, golfing outside, and inside on rainy days or so on, the bowling alleys and uh, shuffleboard and things of that nature. And this is the space that actually had, uh, I was probably one of the last classes to actually bowl in here. Uh, and we would come down here, just put our books away, and you could come in here and uh, just enjoy it till the bus time was well, time to leave. It is very different today. There were three alleys, obviously, one, two, three, leaving a walkway up that wall. A really fascinating thing is that we had, or they had, I never saw them. They were gone by 1957 when I came to school. Automatic pin setters. There was something called the Bacchus Auto Automatic Pin Setting System. And it was a fellow by the name of Bacchus, obviously, that had a, uh, invented them. And they were very mechanical. Uh, we do have some pictures of the alleys used by students showing that, and they might be on the wall over here. We'll check in a second. Uh, we don't, I don't know when they were taken out. They weren't here in the 50s when I got here. But they were big mechanical things that came out on pulleys, and they would, you would have a disc, and you set the pins in, and then the disc would descend onto the pin spots on the alley. Uh, what did they do after they removed those? It was very simple. Freshmen became pin setters, maybe for a nickel a, a, a game or something like that. So we would sit up on the rails or on the back of the, the pits, and then the upper class would bowl, or we'd take turns for each other. Scoring was at the other end, and two return racks and rails went down the center of the room. And if you kind of turn around to that side, all those mirrors, the first two sets of mirrors held a full-size shuffleboard. Perhaps what the length actually was, but it was a major shuffleboard uh, situation. You can see how big, there were big mechanical behemoths up there. This was taken after 1938, because that's when that priest arrived here. So they could be in the 40s. Uh, Actually, probably early 40s because he would be the headmaster in the late 40s. Yeah, I think this so, was around 1938 when Father did he first arrived. He got here in 38, he did, yeah. but he wasn't headmaster, right? No, not until, until 46. 40 something when he really got sick. And I believe these are photos from the 1938 yearbook. Yeah, so you can see how big that mechanical system was hanging out of the wall there. And here's the other end of the alleys. Looks like they were all hams. Can you imagine putting a coat and tie on today to bowl? Seriously? This was great fun. I mean, you went to school all day in the garage, came through the tunnel, and came back over here and played around until it was time for your bus to leave if you didn't have sports practice. We didn't have a gymnasium until 1939. 
And here's another yes. exhibit up here. The history of bowling at Archmere does go back many years. And in fact, when I was a student here in the 70s, <coughs> we used to go down the Philadelphia Pike to Holiday Lanes and form teams with the yes. teachers. Yeah. And there would be a huge tournament over the winter. And uh, I, it really came from the fact that when the school was founded, a bowling alley came with the house. And suddenly in 1935-36, we had a bowling team. Yeah. And uh, this is from the 1935 first yearbook called The Keystone. Yeah. Uh, where they're reminiscing about the initiation of this annual tournament that Father McKeo, I think, um, began. Um, Neil McLaughlin, class of 36, Jack Feldman, 36. Now, uh, Father Feldman was Norbertine priest. Yeah, he was one of my teachers. And there's another picture that does show the Bacchus. Let me see if I can move this out of the way for you. It's a little bit clearer than the one down at the other end you get a little better shot of how massive that thing was. It must have made a heck of a noise, clanking. And so you might ask, what happened to the bowling alley? Well, similar to the foyer area or the vestibule area, it became very, very badly damaged over the years due to water that was pouring in from these window <laughs> wells. And uh, eventually the wood rotted, the systems didn't function anymore, and it was completely removed. What was beneath it was pretty much a dirt floor. And so I guess it was about uh, 2013 or so, 2013, 14, that we poured a new concrete floor. We put in cable and wire uh, for internet. And then we put in this hardwood floor with a bounce for dance and movement. Because it didn't seem functional and realistic to put back a bowling alley. But we also wanted to make it uh, somewhat reminiscent of the space that it once was. So you can see we have all these mirrors on here for dance and movement, choreography for our shows, uh, our foreign language, our Spanish club uh, does a salsa dancing down here. <laughs> and as you can see, it's set up now for a photography shoot. So the students really do use this space uh, and it's a very functional space. Now let's continue up this way. We have still a little bit more to show you. So this, this really looks like something you'd see in an English pub or something. Tell us about this room, Tom. Actually, that's pretty close. Uh, this is, we call it the smoking room. I think that's what it was on the blueprint as well. Uh, it's a very typical space for a gentleman, gentleman's country estate in America, actually in England too. And it really would have been a room probably with club chairs sitting around having a drink if you're bowling maybe you can come in and, and uh, kibitz or socialize this is the only fireplace in the basement of the house and there are at least 15 to 20 other fireplaces around the house this side of the, uh, uh, of the of the house but this is the only one in the basement so they could have a roaring fire here every fireplace you see in the house was at the time would would be functional yeah. on that. But this has been turned into a recreation room. When I was a student, it served the purpose. It had ping pong tables. So if we weren't shuffleboarding or bowling, we were ping ponging in here. By the way, I found in the patio, they had ping pong tournaments in the patio. They, they dragged ping pong tables up. They made the best out of what they had. Uh, following up on what you said about why we have the bowling tournament, uh, we also had a golf team because the, there was a nine hole course on the property. So we inherited that, so why not yeah. make use of it? Kind of unusual yeah. as we, well. We've now renovated the space in recent years. Again, water damage um, hurt a lot of the paneling. The paneling is uh, 19th century barn wood, and it's very, very rare and very expensive to replace. So the original paneling is on the interior walls and some of the exterior walls. The remainder of the exterior walls had to be replaced in a like kind of material because we couldn't really fine, or if we could, we probably couldn't afford to replace it with the original barn wood that was there. Fixtures in here too were replaced with fluorescence. We have just a glimpse through a picture of the bowling alley of what one of the sconces may have looked like in here. So these are all reproduction pieces in the room. And now we use it for meeting spaces. Uh, we could have a seminar down here with students. Our parent clubs use it for meetings for planning purposes and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it is, a, it is a great space. And uh, what I want to mention too, which is really interesting, uh, on this part of the uh, wall, there's a screen, that's the organ screen. And then we also see a ventilation system, a motorized ventilation system to extract smoke from the room. Yes, 
That's common too. I, at Nemours Alfred DuPont's mansion, there was a rheostat in a closet that sucked air out at, at your appropriate at the appropriate volume mm -hmm. out of the smoking room or the billiards room in that case it yeah. was over there. But there is one more feature. If we look at this uh, set of balusters up here, the wooden <coughs> balusters made in the same wood. Remember, we both made uh, reference to a massive pipe organ that was installed. Most of that organ is down here in the basement. That You see light behind those. They're shutters. Think of Venetian blinds where somebody puts a switch and a motor will open them up. And if they were opened up, we would see the pipes. If the organ were playing, when it opened, it would get louder down here. The organ was a player organ. In other words, they could put like a player piano, they could put rolls in and play any music they want. So you don't have to have an organist if you want music while you bowl. I don't know what you bowl to. Oh, <laughs> Bolero, <laughs> maybe Bolero. Uh, whatever it is, you could still do that. And uh, you can attenuate the sound down here by opening and closing. It's talking to me, hear it? They're testing it. Actually, to finish up our tour, we're going to walk you through a little corridor and show you the room that was the billiard room, and we'll let you peek in the door of that room, which will be the feature of a future A event. future episode, episode, yes. Come on this way. So this was the billiard room. We don't have any information how this was furnished. Uh, when I was a student, it was used as a little classroom. We called it the visual aids room. 16 millimeter projector on a big table back there, a screen that dropped at that end. Uh, beautiful asbestos acoustic tiles on the walls. It was a mar very marvelous space. Just imagine what it might have been in the Rascals. My guess it would have been very similar to the smoking room, wouldn't you I think would so? think, I would think as so. Well, uh, that. So we don't have any information other than there were billiards for the Raskob in here, and it became a classroom later. And now, as we both promised, the main organ chamber has pipes that are so tall that the floor level in this basement even is not deep enough. So this room through that door plunges down so that the tallest pipes can stand in there, and the sound comes up through in the music room on the first floor. In the main. And if you opened all of those sets of French doors, the music would pour out into the patio. And then over on the right by the fireplace, the echo division could chime in when the organist wanted. Let's take yeah. a peek here. It'll be kind of a, a teaser for what might come. Be careful of the steps. It, it's very steep. Okay, what we did was make a complete circuit around underneath the patio itself. And the door over to my right is where all the heating and ventilation equipment is. And you know, a lot of people when they tour old houses want to know how much did this cost, how much did that cost. The organ, we do know the price, and it didn't come in over budget because it was bought from a company. Raskob paid $30,000 for the or original organ that was installed here in the house. Uh, I found out that the electrical wiring was $10,000 budgeted, but cost $23,000. Uh, so there are wonderful, like, we found fragments, of, wonderful fragments of information about what was spent on what, and pretty much everything came in way over budget, not unlike modern contracting. The house was budgeted out of 450 to 500,000. It came in close to a million. Well, Tom, thank you so much for giving us this fabulous tour. I've learned so many new things that I never knew about the basement of the manor and the patio. And uh, I'm so excited that we were able to show our guests places they never would visit. 
otherwise. Or, or never would be able to, actually, because it would be too, a little bit too dangerous. Absolutely. As I said at the beginning, attics and basements are the most fascinating things about old houses, and this is an old house. Well, well, we thank you very much for joining us today. We hope that you can come back another time for another episode and perhaps also for a personal visit and tour of the house when we're able to do so. But until then, uh, may your home be as enriched and blessed as this home has been over its many years and many uses by not only the family, the Raskovs, but also by the family that we call Archmere. So God bless and we'll see you next time. Okay, shall we head? Yeah.